Um, okay. Thanks a lot, Stefano, for uh, the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here in Bologna. It's actually my first uh, trip for more than two years for work-related reasons. So it's really nice to be back here. And I'd like to tell you here about some uh, recent work we've been doing, especially in, in uh, collaboration with Stefano on uh, uh, the mass profiles of galaxy clusters and how we can use them to constrain some properties of the dark matter and how we can also test the properties of uh, uh, the theory of gravity. Okay, so um, I guess a number of you are already familiar with the field of clusters, but still for those of you who are not, uh, I guess you may have seen sometimes the simulations like the one I'm showing here, which is a slice of the illustrious TNG simulation where you, I'd like you to focus on this uh, panels at the top, top left part, where you see the column density of gas in the top left, dark matter here in uh, orange and stars in black. And you can see that uh, in dense regions, the uh, baryonic content of clusters of, uh, of, of, of the universe is getting heated by uh, shocks and uh, structure formation until it gets very to very large, very high temperatures of the order of uh, beyond 10 million Kelvin or so. And uh, uh, such that we are actually able to observe the majority of the baryonid, baryons in uh, using X-ray observations of the hot plasma. And at the same time, we can also use the sunyaev zaldovich effect, which is the uh, distortion of spectral distortion of the CMB when it goes through a galaxy cluster. This is uh, uh, also an, a, another probe of the hot gas in the structure. And what you can see here is that the get distribution of the hot gas and its properties, they are tracing very closely the uh, underlying dark matter distribution. So it means that the hot gas is a very good tracer of the uh, of the properties of of, uh, of dark matter and also about the how gravity is getting together in order to form structures and in fact when we look at numerical simulations that's been known for more than 20 years we know that the gravitationally collapsed halos in uh, generally in cdm cosmology we know that they share all the same structural properties. So uh, that the, the mass profiles, density profile are uh, shown on the left-hand side here. The density profiles are, can look very much similar for wherever, whichever type of structure you're looking at from the dwarf galaxies to the most massive clusters. And uh, we usually parameterize this with the navarro frank white functional form, which is given by this uh, uh, expression here. And uh, uh, one important parameter of this uh, navarro frank white form is it the, what we call a concentration that is shown on the right hand side there. Concentration being the ratio of, uh, when we talk about here C200, the ratio of the uh, scale radius, which is where the uh, density slope is equal to minus two, to the um, to the mass of the system, to the overall radius of the system, R200. And what we can see is that this uh, concentration here is also a strong prediction of, uh, of the CDM scenario. So if you're able to actually measure this mass concentration relation, you can test our understanding of structure formation in the, in the lambda CDM paradigm. Uh, more recently, what we have found is that the navarro frank white form is not an actually very good fit to the simulated uh, halos. And there, there was a, a number of papers like the one I'm showing on the right side, which show that we could, when using the Inesto form, which has one more parameter here, the alpha parameter, when using the Inesto form, we are doing a much better job at reproducing the shape of the mass profile of halos, and that is shown here on, the, on, on this plot where you see black points are actual mass profile 
And uh, the, green, the green curve here is the inastophyte, while the orange is the NFW. And you can see that this inasto curve is doing a, a very good job at reproducing the observed mass profile. On the, on the bottom panel here, I'm showing the logarithmic slope of the profile as a function of radius. And you can see again that the, especially in the inner region, the logarithmic slope of the profile is a little bit different from a, an NFW profile. So of course, one interesting thing that we would want to do is to try to constrain the parameter of the Sinasto profile to get back to the formation of structures in the universe. Uh, just to give you an idea now of what this uh, Inasto profiles look like, especially there is, as I said, there is this additional parameter alpha that I'm going to talk about quite a bit during this talk, which we call the Inasto index. And uh, this Inasto index alpha is gover governing the curvature of the profile. So large value of alpha here, alpha equal one, means you have flat cores and very curved profiles, while low value of alpha, this is for alpha equal 0.1, you see the uh, log slope of the profile is, uh, it looks very much like a power law. Uh, another thing that we were able to see in recent uh, simulation is that this uh, uh, Inasto profile, the shape of this uh, Inasto profile can be related to the primordial power spectrum. So what you can see on the right hand side here, these are, are various uh, uh, simulation sets where you change the slope of the primordial power spectrum. So in the early universe, we expect that structure have uh, formed already with a, with a power spectrum that was like, looked like a power law. And the slope of this power spectrum governs the shape of the halos in the, uh, in the following, in the evolution of the universe. This means that, uh, again, now we can relate this alpha parameter to the primordial power spectrum, such that uh, we can again trace back, compare what we see in the current universe with the very early universe to try to understand uh, the formation of structures. Okay, so how do we do this uh, observationally speaking? In uh, our case, we try to use uh, the two different probes of the hot gas. As I've said, the hot gas is uh, more or less in equilibrium within the potential well that is set by the dark matter. And we have those two probes. The first one is the X-ray emission, which is uh, the Bremsstrahlung emission, direct emission coming from the interaction of uh, free electrons with free ions in the plasma. And when they interact, they emit an X-ray photon. And the X-ray emissivity of the plasma is proportional to the square of the gas density integrated along the line of sight. On the other hand, we have the sunyaev zeldovich effect, which is the inverse Compton scattering of the CMB photons when they go through the hot plasma. When they go through the hot plasma, some of the CMB photons are, are doing a, a Compton scattering. And when they do this, they gain a small fraction of energy. And uh, the total amplitude of this spectral distortion is proportional to the integrated pressure of the gas along the line of sight. So it means that if you have access to both these two probes, X-ray and Sunyev zeldovich then uh, you can combine them and get back, first of all, through the ideal gas equation. You know, If you have the pressure, you've got the density, then you can get back to the temperature. Uh, you can get back to the specific entropy by combining, again, those two observables. And now, uh, if you assume that the gas is in hydrostatic equilibrium within the potential well, then you know that the pressure gradient must be balancing the gravitational force. And so if you're able to measure the gas pressure from the SZ observation and the gas density from the X-ray observations, then you see that you can get back to the total mass here and trying to understand the distribution of mass among the system, okay? So the data that we use for this project are the uh, XCOP project for XMM cluster outskirts project. This is a very large program on XMM that uh, I was the PI of about uh, seven years ago now. 
And the idea was that we would follow up with a deep XMM observation. We would follow up clusters that were detected in the Suny Evzeldovich uh, survey by the Planck satellite. And these are the highest signal to noise uh, clusters in Planck. So they have a very strong uh, as a signal such that we can measure the pressure profile very well. And you can see these are just a, a, a gallery of the mosaic, X-ray mosaic observations of these systems. Uh, you can see that we are able again to detect a, a large number of substructures, large number of uh, uh, details in, the, in these systems. So here are what they look like now in the SZ effect. So I'm showing here from a paper by uh, Anna Silvia Baldi two years ago. These are reconstruction of the SZ effect from the XCOP clusters with them. You see these types of maps. Of course, Planck had some pretty poor uh, angular resolution of the, of the order of the eight arc minutes. So the, the observations are not so detailed. However, uh, it's also very sensitive. So we are able to get the pressure profile to very large radii, in fact, to much larger radii than what we can do in the X-ray observations. So now putting those two observab observables together, we can do a couple of things. The first, we can get the gas density profiles from the X-ray observations after having properly removed the substructures, clumps, and so on. And we get this type of uh, uh, profiles for each of the systems in our sample. And then we can also construct pressure profiles from the SZ observations and by also in the innermost regions where we don't really have the resolution from the SZ, we can complement that with spectroscopic temp temperature profiles from the X-ray directly. And you can see that we have some very detailed measurements of these pressure profiles and gas density profiles. So we can get back to the mass profiles with very good precision. Okay, so first of all, in order to do that, we have to make sure that uh, the, the two data sets are consistent because they are completely independent from a statistical point of view from one another. And that what is shown on the left-hand side here, which is this uh, uh, quantity we call eta SZ, that is the ratio of the pressure average pressure measured by the uh, SZ experiment from Planck to the corresponding quantity where you use the X-ray temperatures that you get from X-ray spectroscopy. And you see that the two measurements are in very good agreement with one another with an average ratio of 0.96 plus minus 0.08. So it means that we are confident that we are really probing the same quantities and we can combine them effectively. So in a, this paper by Stefano a couple of years ago, the first thing we did was to try to fit several different mass models to the data and see which one was going to give the best, uh, the best uh, representation of the, 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 of the data, we do this by the base factor, which is here on the Y parameter. So then for each of the cluster that I show here, the point at the bottom is the, represents the model that better, best fits the data. And then this range here, uh, the gray, light gray range is where we think that the two models are acceptable. The model is, is not preferred, but still acceptable. Light gray, the model is slightly preferred, dark gray, sorry. And in the, right, in the white region, the model is strongly disfavored by the data. And what you can see is that the Navarro Frank White and Inasto profiles that I show here, they are very often accepted or uh, preferred by the data. While the profiles which have a strong core in the center like isothermal sphere, non-singular isothermal sphere and Burkhardt, you see they are very often, they are uh, completely, uh, ruled out by the data. What we could do was also to compare the mass that we would see with some, with some uh, expectations of modified gravity theories and especially MOND. MOND is, means modified Newtonian dynamics, which is the simplest way of modified, modifying gravity to try to explain the, uh, the presence of dark matter. So without having to use dark matter, trying to explain the gravitational fields that we observe. 
One point I want to make here is that the INASTO index in that, in that uh, study was fixed to alpha equal 0.2, while in the latter, we are going to let this parameter free and trying to measure it. Okay, so the one quick uh, point about uh, the, how we are going to do this, the main uh, uh, issue that we are having to get back to the 3D structure of our systems is that when in practice, the images that we have, they are projected along the line of sight, of course, and then they are blurred by the uh, PSF of the instruments. So if you have a 3D structure like this, then what you're seeing is a 2D image that is projected along the line of sight, then it's blurred by the PSF. Then you can have, you will have a sky image that will introduce some uh, uh, astrophysical sources like background that are not related to the, uh, to, the, to the source itself. And then you're going to get a Poisson realization of that. So a photon map like this, and you can see that getting from this photon map back to the 3D uh, structure is, is pretty difficult. So in order to do this, we implement a linear combination of basis functions, which is a sort of non-parametric Bayesian approach to forward fit our observed counts. And uh, we model, we uh, implement a mass modeling scheme that jointly fits all the data that we, that we have at hand. So we have, we start with a gas density profile that is described again by this non-parametric, this deconstruction. And we have a model for the mass here. By combining those two and through the hydrostatic equilibrium equation, we get a model for the 3D pressure, which we can again then combine with the density to get a model for the temperature and for the 2D pressure when you project along the line of sight. Well, density itself is going to be projected and uh, predict the X-ray surface brightness. And all of this is convolved with the PSF of the two instruments and fitted to the data. The, so the X-ray surface brightness profile, X-ray spectroscopic temperature profile, and SZ profile such that we uh, reconstruct the data. We also try to implement uh, a non-parametric log normal mixture reconstruction. I'm not going to go into the detail here, but this time we measure that we model the temperature profile as a linear combination of log normal functions. So just to give you an idea of this type of reconstruction. So we have uh, the, this type here, the red points are the X-ray surface brightness profile for this system above 1795. Then we, we are modeling this with a, uh, with a linear combination of, uh, of uh, basis functions, which gives this uh, blue curve here, which is then convolved with the PSF of the instrument. On the other hand, we have, we here, I'm, talk, I'm showing the results of the non-parametric approach where the temperature profile is, uh, is uh, deconstructed now as a, as a mixture of log normal functions. And I, we end up after fitting with this uh, type of uh, green profiles here that include that fits jointly the X-ray and Sunyev Zeldovich information. Now this is the type of profiles we get for the pressure profile on the left hand side, and then for the total hyd hydrostatic mass on the right hand side. And uh, finally, when we fit um, when we fit a mass model here, this is for the INASTO profile we get this type of uh, posterior distributions for the parameters of the INASTO profile with this value quantity mu here, which is the uh, opposite of the alpha index. So here, alpha would be one over four, so it would be 0.25. So now about the results. So here I'm showing the results, comparing results of the, the NFW and INASTO fits to our, all our systems and I'm comparing this with the non-parametric results such that we can get an idea of how well the mass model is re reproducing our data. And you can see, especially in the central region, that the, there is quite a lot of scatter in the non-parametric points compared to the NFW fits. While the INASTO profiles, they, are, they have a little bit more freedom and they are much more, much closer to the expected uh, profiles such that it looks like there is a bit more variety, especially in the cores of systems than what can be captured with just the NFW profiles. 
Now putting all of this together here. Five I'm showing, minutes, Dominique. Thanks. I'm showing the sample average uh, with the uh, all the points, the black point. The, so the red points are the average parametric profiles in our systems. And these are com compared with INASTO in uh, blue and NFW in green. So as you can see, the median profiles, they look very closely like an NFW with difference less than 10%. And I say similar with an INASTO. We can also check this relation between concentration and mass, which is a prediction of the Lambda CDM paradigm. And here again, we see that the, here I'm showing the, the, our results. This is the mean concentration in our system shown in red. And we were one sigma and two sigma contours. And the different curves are showing recent predictions from end body simulations. And you can see they are uh, essentially spot on. So we are confirming this, uh, the prediction of the lambda CDM paradigm. Then what we can do is to try to see how, what happens when we uh, about when we try to change the properties of dark matter, and especially if we introduce dark matter self-interactions. So if the, the, the cross-section of interaction of dark matter with itself is greater than zero. Then in that case, there were some uh, recent simulation here by uh, Robertson, who showed that if you change the, if you increase this dark matter self-interaction, then what you do is you cut off the, profiles in the central region. So you end up with having a core with respect to the uh, CDM case that would keep rising like this. And what we've seen was that if we fit those profiles in simulations with the Dynasto profile, that the Dynasto index is a tracer of the, dark matter, of the interaction of dark matter with itself. And you can see that here. So on the left-hand side, I'm showing individuals individual uh, systems with the values fitted value of, uh, of uh, INASTO in the CDM case. And when you increase this, the, the dark matter self-interaction cross-section, and here this is the mean val median value and the percentiles. And you can see that when you increase this value of the cross-section, you increase correspondingly the INASTO index. So what we could do was to measure the INASTO index with, for all of our systems. And we get to this type of measurements. Now you can see there is a number of outliers there. And when we look at them, we actually found that all of these outliers are, are uh, strongly disturbed clusters. So they, they, they are showing strong deviations from, uh, from spherical symmetry. And so we, there could be a lot of issues in our reconstruction here, hydrostatic bias, miscentering, and so on. Now, if we only select the regular X-ray clusters, the one that look more or less roundish, then we get much smaller scatter and this uh, uh, pink curve here. Now we, what we can do is we can uh, compare that with the simulation. So we make a similar selection of systems in the simulation to get only the relaxed systems. And we compare with our data. And we, this is our results. So here, these are the, this is the mean value of our alpha in our data with respect to the simulations. And you can see that uh, this is for the full sample now, and this is for the regular subsample where we have taken only the systems that look, that look relaxed in the X-ray uh, observations. And you can see that the results are consistent with the prediction of, of the CDM scenario. And this allows us to set an upper limit on the self-interaction dark matter cross-section. Cross so uh, that is what we get. So on, basically what we do is just to fit the relation between sigma, the mean sigma in the simulation and the INASTO index. And then we propagate the posterior of the mean value of alpha through this relation. And we get the posterior distribution for sigma, which is shown by the blue curve here for the regular subsample. And that gives us an upper limit of 0.13 centimeter square per ground program on uh, at 90% confidence level. So that is about 10 times deeper than what you can do with the individual merging clusters like the bullet cluster. So we are not finding any indication for, for self-interacting dark matter. 
Okay, then the last point that we can do is we can, for a number of systems, we also have measurements of stellar components, the bright, brightest cluster galaxies, and also the satellite galaxies, so that such that we can decompose the gravitational field into all these various components, baryonic and dark matter. And that is what you can show, see on the left-hand side here, where we are showing the brightest cluster galaxy in green, dark matter in purple, gas in red, in satellite galaxy in cyan. And right hand side is the total baryon fraction as a function of radius. Putting all of this together, then what we can do is we can study the uh, properties of gravity itself. So in the, in, there was a claim a couple of years, uh, like five years ago, that there is a very strong relation between the acceleration, the um, the gravitational acceleration that is expected just on the basis of baryons and the one that is observed on the, on the, on the y-axis here. And uh, that is for a sample of, uh, of uh, disk galaxies. You can see that they tend to uh, follow a, a universal relation that was called the radial acceleration relation. So if that is due to uh, universal property of gravity, then we should see the same relation in our clusters. So that is what we try to test. And we, that is not what we found. So here I'm showing in black the curve that was fitted to the disk galaxies. And uh, here each of the curves is one individual cluster. And as you can see, the, we can rule out this uh, radial acceleration uh, relation at high significance. So it means our conclusion is that this is probably not a fundamental property of gravity and any model, modified gravity model will need to take that into account. Okay, so this is the end of my talk and this is the take home message. So uh, first I'd like to tell you that we put together this framework to set constraints on the gravitational fields. If you with from joint X-ray and SZ data, actually the code is, uh, is now public, so if you're interested, you can uh, you can ask me. With that, we were able to measure the to get precise measurements of the INASTO index alpha, and to look at the mass profile, the average mass profile among our system, where we showed that they are consistent with NFW on average at less than ten percent uh, precision. The INSTO index alpha is sensitive to the dark matter self-interaction cross-section. When you increase the, the, the cross-section, the, you, you increase the curvature of the profile and you, you increase alpha correspondingly. And through this method, from our measurements of alpha, we were able to set an upper limit to the dark matter self-interaction cross-section of 0.13 centimeters square per gram at 90% confidence level. And finally, we studied also the relation between bionic and total acceleration, and we found that it doesn't match what is, a, what is found in these galaxies, such that this is probably not a fundamental property of gravity. Thanks very much for your attention, and happy to take questions.